Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Brightworks, where what I've got for you today is another set of matches that was played in the 5 versus 5 tournament. I wanted to take another look at what the pros are up to in these extremely high-coordination, high-stakes matches. So today, spawning on the southern side and representing the blue team is an Armada commander. Goes by the name of Goopy and coming in at 53, 53 true skill. Silver chevrons as well, hailing from the Americas. Goopy should have a lot to put on the line for us today. Going to be leading the red team over on the other side. Goes by the name of Master Bell, spawning... As the color might indicate, as a Cortex Commander here, going into that triple mech start on the map that is called Altered Divide. Yes? Okay. Just making sure I didn't forget the name of this one. Altered Divide. Not a map we see a whole lot in the 8v8 scene. And for the most part, that's because there's not a lot of spots to spawn on an 8v8. It's not necessarily intended as an 8v8. However, it's just about perfect for a 5 versus 5. And that's exactly what we have here today. Going to be the Control D team going up against the... Uh, the blue team. <laughs> Guess no uh, overarching team name was established right here for the blue players, but that's okay. I'm sure team coordination is going to be absolutely top notch. I'm almost certain that all these players were in discords at the time, so there's verbal communication. Might mean we don't see very, very much uh, in-game communication aside from maybe pings here and there. Maybe a couple of drawings too. Uh, but assume that each of these players is communicating to the absolute peak that they can through their microphones into the internet and out their teammates, well, out into their teammates' ears. Everybody, though, looking like they're starting things up pretty standard for the time being. Now, I'm curious how coordinated these spawns were as far as who goes vehicles, who goes bots. I imagine each player is probably playing mostly to their strengths, but maybe there was a little coordination, like sending vehicles down on the pathways that have mostly flat terrain, this sort of a thing, and then kind of similarly over on this northern side. I imagine that might have been a discussion here as to the most appropriate ways to start this. I think probably Ambulatory and Master Bell here are in the two positions that can afford to choose bots or vehicles. Bots are going to be quite nice, by the way, for selectively pushing these hillside areas right here where the terrain is a little bit too difficult for vehicles to traverse, but definitely going to be an asset overall to get those res bots out and collecting all the stones and statues and other uh, random things that exist on this map. There go some of those uh, precious ancient artifacts being turned into valuable metal for the war effort. Nice snipe right here by the Grunt from Akumu. Going to blast down one of these resbots right here. That's an excellent start to this match. Pawns coming out here. Going to be microed back against. Absolutely phenomenal. Always important to keep those Grunts well microed, so I'm glad to see that we're doing that. We do have a single rover pumped out, by the way, from Jean Doe, who is sending it over on the right-hand side as we are getting ready to establish our front lines here. Yeah. Blue player. Goopy. Going to be sending him forward a couple of pawns. Trying desperately to contest a little bit more of this area. Obviously, getting these metal extractors up and running is going to be paramount, critical, and absolutely necessary for each and every one of these commanders right here. Going into an early energy converter, I guess it makes sense. Wind speed is fairly high on this map, actually. Highs of 19, lows of 4. Means that at least for the Armada commanders, even at the lowest point, still going to be relatively efficient. I don't mind that early energy converter, actually. It's not a tremendous advantage, but certainly over time, it can be. Now, the lack of a res bot right here for Akumu definitely can hurt... Uh, sorry, no, the lack of the resbot for MDXD. Akumu sniped the resbot for MDXD, so MDXD, the green commander here, had to build a second one, meaning that the resbot back here for Akumu is going to be more than capable of eating up all this juicy, juicy metal. I'd actually like to see it go resurrect the resbot that was taken down previously. Ooh, puns get on top of the grunts here. Nice little trade right there. That's a fabulous trade. We got to get the resbot in there, picking those bots back up and putting them on the front line. If we can get those bots resurrected, I think that's a fabulous trade right there and could spiral into a domination right there for the green commander on the left-hand side. But it is a two versus one, so you have to be a little bit wary of that as well. And we're diving the resbot instead here. I think that's probably a worthwhile trade, but it does mean there's essentially no force on the front. And these insides are going to be bringing the fury. Purple commander reclaiming a couple of those fallen bots off the front lines here. Grunts do spot that resbot. Ooh, it'll run for its life, but I just don't think it has the foot space to get away and it does indeed fall nice little pickoff right there from master bell as well a little pawn sneak sneak past here running into the back line trying desperately to anyway grunt stream is unmasked though and will eventually catch that pawn and bring an end to it always good to keep aware of that pawns and grunts can run around on this terrain these mountainous terrains they can be quite a nuisance this is dangerous though this is a concerted push over on the left-hand side going up against one player. Looks like the Cyan Commander... Did we just... I guess we just got off to a slow start here. Heavy heavy investment in the early game economy and then 
very slow to produce the units means that a lot of this front line is up and available right here for the red commanders to take advantage of the metal extractor is probably the most important thing here but also all this metal that's been left over as units on the ground mdxd's commander is forced up to the front lines here is essentially the only thing that can actually effectively deal with these grunts in any reasonable efficient manner finally some pawns at the battlefield Still not going to be ideal, though. I almost would have preferred a Rocketeer transition right there, just so we can start getting those heavy hitters out on the battlefield. Might be one of the only ways to make this more and more efficient. Efficient enough that you can reclaim all that lost land over on the left-hand side. Meanwhile, through the middle of the map, the Blue Commander is on an excellent tear. We haven't really secured the Metal Extractors here. That's kind of the point of this aggression, is to claim these Metal Extractors, so leaving those untouched... Definitely means that this aggression is going to cost a whole lot from the blue commander. That cost is offset significantly by the resbot right here. What is this little tower? It's a street lamp. Large street lamp. Not worth any metal or energy. Interesting. I love the little designs that are implemented in this game. The cute little architectures. Indicators of past civilizations. Now ravaged by the ongoing war. Beautiful in some senses. Horrifying in others, I suppose. Yeah, there are those resbots. Picking this army back up. Making an army out of the graves of the fallen. It's the superpower of the Resbot. It's the reason why they're so critical, especially in a bot versus vehicle matchup right here. But in this case, it's the players with the vehicles on the front that actually have the Resbot advantage. Definitely not a good look right here for the blue team on the left-hand side. So we're going for economy. Economy like crazy here. I guess the idea is that MDXD has been handed all the units and is going to hold the left side while we have the economy growing in the back line. It's not a bad idea, but why haven't we grabbed the metal extractor if we're just going to go so heavily into the economy? Definitely a question resounding in my ears. We also have another untapped mechs over here. Ah, a little bit sloppy on the blue team. Missing so many of those mechs definitely starts to hurt really, really quickly. Cannot afford to keep even those two metal extractors per second metal extractors unclaimed for any amount of time. You gotta remember, that's metal per second, baby, and we're already six minutes into this game. Means that it's not gonna be long before already hundreds and hundreds of metal and eco damage has been done. I missed a commander kill over on the right-hand side. We did have the Seafoam Green Commander going down. John Doe managed to reclaim all of the metal out of that corpse, or just about all of it. Two killer D-guns on those riot tanks take a whole lot of firepower out of the front line right here as well, leaving the Seafoam Green Commander Didich in a little bit of trouble. Goopy trying desperately here as well. Ah, things are looking more and more bleak here for the blue team. Suddenly, Control D is just everywhere. Medium tanks, applying a whole bunch of pressure to these Rocketeers that got caught out in the middle of the map. We have a bunch of Grunts also jumping on top of those relatively slow Rocket Bots. This is a nice little pull right here. Pawns jump on top of this big ball. We were starting that Aggravator Ball, and we caught it before it managed to snowball here. Pawns can absolutely do critical damage. Oh, the Resbot, where is it going? On a journey, a magical journey away from the back lines where it should be eating up all this juicy, juicy, juicy metal. There we go. It's going to start reclaiming right here, but I think it's well within firing range of a bunch of those aggravators. Oh, no. There we go. It's finally pulled back. By some miracle, it manages to survive, but that was absolutely a bit of Miss Micro right there. Blue Commander are going to be trying to use these pawns, but every single step forward the Master Belt takes with the Commander is going to mean just a little bit more metal tucked into the Red Bank account, and eventually that metal ends up back on the field, facing off against the very army that it's used, or that that was used to kill it. Resbots. Repairing each other, giving each other a little massage. I don't mind it. Getting those resbots up and running actually makes a lot of sense. And a ton of eco damage has been done over here on the left-hand side. All right. Despite the a little bit of a micro error over here on the left-hand side, definitely made up for by the fact that we did so much damage to all these metal extractors over on this side. Kind of only evens things up, though, because all the mechs in the back line are taken by the red team, plus a couple in the front, versus we are missing at least one metal extractor in the back here. Ah, definitely not perfect. Shurikens are pulled right here. Definitely a killer transition Master Bell has gone for right here. This is the tried and true, the Cortex Classic. You go for a whole bunch of shurikens if your lead is pressed. And there you go. Just shut down this entire front line. If we had a couple of resbots to pick this up, it would absolutely seal the deal. But already these units are moving forward, trading 100% efficient, efficiently against this army that cannot fight back. Shurikens, man. What a stinker of a unit. Down goes the entire army of the Blue Commander. What a left field play, but a beautiful one at that from Master Bell, showing us that he got the technical skills to what it takes in order to close out one of these games here. Yeah, those shurikens shut down the lab right here as well. Grunts now on top of all the production. Not sure why we pulled the shuriken away. Oh, well, I guess to try and shut down some of this run by over here. Not the worst, not, or not the end of the day, end of the, uh, end of the play here. Yeah, Grunts still alive and well in the back line. Gonna take down all those mechs. And that is effectively Goopy out of this match. Commander is still alive on the right-hand side. We could certainly see it rebuild. 
But man, that amount of damage in the back line definitely stings. Only a single constructor remains. We are going to try and build a little more build power right here. I'd love to see some constructors handed over from some other teammates. Maybe try and help Goopy rebuild in the back line just about as quickly as possible. But with the Shuriken already on the field, it's going to be tremendously difficult to do anything about the fact that we, uh, yeah, essentially are going up against an army that can completely nullify everything on the ground. Sprinters are out here, so that tech advantage is finally showing itself. These sprinters need to get some serious damage done if they want to express any kind of advantage. I think those shuriken are going to essentially nullify it, though. Yeah, here they come. The mass shuriken wave. Beautiful play right there. Mass shuriken completely shutting down these expensive T2 assault bots. And just like that, the entire economic advantage is removed. Shurikens, man. Definitely one to be extremely, extremely wary about. There go the incisors into the back line. Take out the last of Goopy's constructor bots, leaving not to put a commander to the name, as well as a couple of straggler metal extractors, but really nothing to speak of. Incisors jump on top of the energy production as well, and that definitely hurts. Resigned, resigned vote is called here for Goopy's team, and indeed, they decide the weight of the red is too much to handle. The shuriken strike was absolutely a killer move right there. Excellently done. Why don't we head on in to game number two of today's cast? Game number two sees us arriving at Tabula Remake. This is one of those classic maps. One of those maps that we see eight versus eights, five versus fives, uh, even one versus ones I've seen on this map. And it's pretty interesting because there's a lot of different reasons to start on different spawn locations. So it's not one of those 1v1 maps where you end up uh, both people spawning in exactly the same location here. Same teams as we just saw go head to head. I believe this series, I believe this match rather was played immediately after the last one, but I can't give you a exact number about it. These were all played privately, so I just have a big folder containing all the replays. I'm not sure exactly which ones were played which though. But anyways, same teams, Master Bell going to be the red team commander, also playing as uh, Cortex once more here. Spawning up in the front line, not a great angle, there we go, is Goopy, who is this time, however, going to be playing as Cortex in blue spawning up on the front line now although already off the bat here we see a little bit of a cheeky play sargeras the hot pink commander has decided to jump into the water here starting off with some title generators 20 title speed definitely well worth it effectively you're getting the energy output of a solar panel a t1 solar panel but for only 85 metal and a little bit of energy very very efficient especially for early game grunt spam which i imagine has got to be exactly oh not what we're going for interesting sargeras actually going directly into the aggravator queue interesting move right there but i suppose it makes sense if you have the energy production and it's stable in order to go for those rocket bots i guess there's no reason why you shouldn't rush directly towards them mdxd rushing straight up to that 4.0 metal extractor and i think that's a great idea holding that 4.0 can definitely turn your economy up by an extra notch you can see the early game economy right here for the green commander is for metal so we're effectively doubling our metal output right now if we can secure that grunt snipes one of the first rovers to head across the map very nice Little ping goes out right there from Akumu to alert his teammates that there's a grunt headed on over. We're going to pull one of these back for some defense. I think it's probably a good idea. Second one will confirm the location and make sure that that incoming grunt doesn't manage to do all too much damage, or at least it shouldn't do all too much damage. A couple of rovers jump on top of it and they should be able to clear it out. But at the very least, as long as we're aware of its position, we know how to counter it. We can move a commander into position. We can make a blitz. We can do all sorts of stuff. Looks like the blitz is going to be the way to go here. I think that's just about perfect. Akumu sends the Blitz out on an intercept course, and I believe this will be shut down quite nicely. Oh, well, maybe not. Grunt going for some evasive maneuvers, going to dive into the water where the Blitz won't follow. Excellent micro right here coming out from Goopy. Nothing less than what I'd expect from these top tier players. Zeke a little bit slower into the water, going for that backline economy, obviously, to justify the slower start here. Does mean that we're a little sore on the metal extractor there and the positioning, but all things considered, it means you start with a slightly better economic situation as opposed to a frontline force here. Was it worth it is the question. Was this was this really aggressive play where we start in the water and push forward really worth it? At the end of the day, it meant that the hot pink commander started with an economy of about seven metal per second, whereas MDXD is going to eventually get up to eight, but there's also a whole bunch of metal extractors that actually aren't queued yet or aren't taken yet. So if we get those under control, it's actually gonna be a huge metal advantage right now for the, uh, the well, the green commander. Eh, it's two versus two over here. Okay, we sniped the metal extractor. We sniped that grunt that was trying to run by. Grunt did take down a title generator. It's more value than I expected, but maybe I should be, uh, maybe I should expect that out of a player as good as Goopy. Couple of grunts checking in on this island up on the northern side, giving Master Bell this much space on the map to do whatever he wants, though definitely has me concerned. We saw just how quickly that shuriken transition happened in the last game. He had 20 or 30 shuriken out before the blink of an eye. 
Uh, I'd be a little worried if I were the blue team realizing, hey, wait a second, we just gave up an entire, almost quarter of the map to the strongest player on the red team here. Zeke's trying to not let that happen, trying to build a couple of LLTs and push forward right here, but I think we're being a little too safe in our push. I think Zeke could definitely stand to move forward and put these LLTs in a more aggressive stance just so that we can try and posture a little bit harder against that red commander. Only takes two or three aggravator to really start becoming uh, lethal against those LLTs, so it's kind of a cost cost efficiency trade-off. Eventually those LLTs become worthless and you really have to start considering upgrading into stronger army units rather than the uh, T1 static defenses here. Jean Doe securing the low ground here, repairing the Blitz, love to see that. Oftentimes the repair micro goes un... well, non-existent. Probably the right word for that. Certainly my own games. Lower APM games. Repair micro seems like a waste of time, but it is relatively easy. It's one of those things that's easy to incorporate, but not necessarily on the top of everybody's list. You know those aggravators. So this is the big advantage that Sargeras has, is that these aggravators come out a little bit sooner. It does mean that the static defenses at the very least are going to fall, as well as that 4.0 metal extractor, which does sort of cripple the economy right here. But this is a nightmare. Ambulatory manages to build up a surprise force in the backline, send it across the map, and surprise ambush MDXT. The entire base falls right there for the Lime Green Commander as the TAN forces move in, snipe a whole bunch of constructors, as well as all the production right here for MDXT, who was forced off the front. Equivalent pressure is going to be applied right here by Sargeras. This is the kind of teamwork that I absolutely love to see. You can tell these guys are playing together, not just playing with each other, right? They're, they're not just eating the same game together. They're absolutely playing uh, with each other's strengths and covering each other's weaknesses here. We do see John Doe's commander go down, as well as the commander here for Goopy. Uh, sorry, not for Goopy, for uh, Zeke up there on the northern side. Uh, actually, a little bit of a commander trade. A couple of thugs there to protect, though, and they're not even scuffed up from that explosion. So definitely in the red player's advantage. Resbot on its way, but also all these metal extractors have been claimed. And that is the, the biggest advantage right here. If MDXD had claimed these mexes a whole lot sooner, I think it would have been a better position for the Lime Green Commander. But right now, base is in ruins, no power production, what to say. The uh, single T1 constructor in the back line fending for dear life, and MDXD is on the back foot. Single hero pawn running by, trying to find that, uh, that grave robber right there. It does find it, but not going to be able to do anything about it. Once this metal goes under red control, it basically guarantees that the red commander is going to have a lockdown on this northern side. Those thugs are going to blast away any of these grunts too. Yeah, grunts relatively thin in the armor department, as far as the grunts are concerned anyways. Oh, the reds, oh no, friendly fire eliminates the resbot right there. That definitely hurts. A huge and important pull from Goopy right here to pull these grunts against all the thugs up on this northern side. It is imperative that this metal doesn't go back into the red economy. Goopy knows that well. But there's just not much that the purple commander can do from this point. Constructor, or the commander was the only amphibious constructor that we could get through the water easily and over to this side. Streaming the units in one by one is not going to be efficient here. One of the only ways you can get back from this is to go into a really efficient army. So go into Thug. Uh, thug Grave Robber is probably the most efficient I can imagine. If we're pushing the LLT here, always risky. Oh, please. There we go. You can see even a single LLT bringing 25%, 26% off that commander's health. So risky over here. Sargeras so doing the same thing. If MDXD can get in front, oh, just barely doesn't. So that's going to be a nice snipe right there for the hot pink commander. MDXD still holding on here, though. Didich was in the back line, was going for a little economy, and is trying to do all this again. But again, we have an untapped metal extractor. It's so high priority that we get those mexes up and running, and we just aren't here on the blue team. Makes me a little bit worried for the sake of the blue team economy. At this point, you can see the red team leading by about 28 middle or so. Not a tremendous advantage, but over time, it definitely does become one. Thugs firing away from long distance here as well, outside the range of these grunts. Despite Micro here from Maximus or Miximus, who is reclaiming the metal. Love to see the metal reclaim. Is there enough to shut down these grunts? Ah, we're going to degun the metal. Okay, we degun down the metal. However, I think we're about to contribute just about 1,250 more. <laughs> Down goes the Cyan Commander. The Grave Robbers are up and running here. They're resurrecting this army on the front line. This army that includes thugs right here, by the way. So we are going eventually into that thug Grave Robber uh, invulnerable push, I want to call it. The, uh, the undead army. The Cortex undead army. It's a strategy as old as time itself, but a very, very powerful one for that. Nearly unstoppable if microed correctly. Very, very efficient. Big old grunt run by happening on the northern side. A 
Blitz will do a decent job of cleaning some of this up here. Two grunts do manage to sneak by, though, and there's some unprotected mechs on this northern side. Well, at least one unprotected mechs. Not the end of the world, but certainly sniping that mechs does help. Every little bit does help. Metal was eaten up, by the way, by the Red Commander, who does put it all directly back into some units. And again, we see that T1 Cortex air transition. We have a couple of shuriken headed out on the map. We have a Grave Robber coming up here to lay some mines as well. Not bad. Certainly quite a capable unit. Quite efficient of a unit. Well worth seeing. Sargeras getting a little greedy on the front lines here. You have to be so careful with the commander stepping forward like this. Obviously, it would be a decent trade to trade out the commander for this entire army and then use a Kumus commander to eat up all that metal, but it's so easy to lose way more than you bargain for in that kind of an engagement. Mass Janus right here being an absolute nuisance, though. Blasting away all that T1 trash with no hesitation. Those heat-seeking twin-guided missiles. Heavy impulse on those, too. Blasting away that T1 like it's nothing. I love a good Janus fire. There's a shuriken up on the northern side of your screen there as well, paralyzing a large portion of the Cyan army. We'll zoom on over to that here. As the shuriken rip and tear until it is done. Beautiful, beautiful play. Once again, Goopy's team throws in the towel, calls the resign boat as the mass shuriken has brought their spirits low. Goopy being forced back on all fronts. MDXD doing a great job of calling back into this, actually. I really thought the Cyan, or sorry, the Lime Green commander was quite a bit worse off than they actually ended up at, but managed to recover nicely. Anti-air has not sprung up immediately, which is a little surprising. I'm, I'm shocked to see that we aren't addressing the shuriken swarm a little more seriously than I imagined we would. At least one member of Goopy's team, or maybe two members of Goopy's team, not ready to throw in the towel yet. Oh, but if that fight is anything to go off of, certainly the time to call it is getting so much closer. Shuriken making this extremely, extremely efficient, and there we go. Control D taking a, uh, well, a game-winning series off of the uh, the blue team. They never had a team name, but we'll call them the Goopy team. Excellently played here by the red team. Control D, Master Bell 2, showing us that really powerful Cortex early T1 air transition and how much work it can get done. Let me know if you like these series or if you prefer the standalone cast down below in the comments section. Always happy to hear feedback from you guys. And uh, other than that, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the very next match of Beyond All Reason. Peace out, everybody.